go. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another great episode of Profiting with Nonprofits. I'm Sean Littman, your host of this super cool, super rad podcast where we sit down with nonprofit professionals and professionals alike in the marketing space and just space in general that gives you the insights on how to manage, run, and change and grow your organization. This week, I'm sitting down with a really awesome guest, Zevi Reinitz. Zevi and I actually used to be neighbors way, way back in the day. And he's like, when we connect, he's like, how do you remember that? And I was like, because I remember everything, bro. And Zevi used to live at the corner of my street back in Oak Park, Michigan, before we all moved to Israel. And I remember it very, very specifically. I think I was friends with his brother. But then we ended up connecting somehow on LinkedIn. He does marketing, which everybody does marketing, but Zevi does a different type of marketing. And it, it just, the conversation spiraled from there. And we're like, we should do a podcast together. So now after procrastinating and procrastinating and, and all sorts of other fun things, we're finally here with Zevi. But before we jump into the show, I'm going, I have to do a plug to our sponsor. This episode is, is sponsored by the C221. It is a all-in-one nonprofit CRM management tool that helps literally change your entire life and the way you organize and run your organization. It has everything you need to manage your donors, manage your contacts, create landing pages, create forms funnels, you name it, it's all there. Email marketing with no caps to your list. Everything is there and it's all for you. The sh- I'm going to drop a link in the show notes. Feel free to sign up for a demo and guess who gives the demo? That's right, me. Because it's our proprietary system that we built for organizations who are small to medium-sized organizations who are who need these tools, are sick of looking at all the tabs on their screen and just can't afford to pay all the price for all these other tools and are most likely technologically inept, but that's okay. So drop, the link will be in the show notes. You can book a demo with me. I'm looking forward to bringing you on board to the system. So far, we have a number of users. They're all super happy, um, but who cares about that right now? Now we're going to sit down and talk to Zevi. So Zevi, what's going on, bro? How are you? Hello, Sean. First of all, that was a great plug, and uh, I'm sold. I'm going to sign up after the... Awesome. Well, Bye. there we go. Another user. Fantastic. Great, like, great to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. And and it's crazy how the internet works because as you mentioned, we grew up in some random suburb of Detroit, Michigan, probably mm-hmm. about, I don't know, 300 feet from one another. And yep. we didn't meet until the LinkedIn algorithm linked us back together. And uh, and so it's great to be here. Gotta love LinkedIn. So so again, you're from Detroit. Why why are you sitting there behind Madison Square Garden? I'm I'm offended. First of all, great, uh, great observability. You know, most people do not know if my head is blocking the Megatron <laughs> stadium. This is, but the truth is, there's a method to the madness, and this is here uh, to scratch my own itch after many, many hours of trial and error. The, the short version is, we all get on Zoom. We all have a ton of meetings in whatever field we are in. Uh, I found though that two things happen. Number one is most of those meetings, if they're with people that you haven't met before, are probably in the range of 30 minutes or less. Uh, The second thing that I noticed is that the vast majority of those meetings are incredibly inefficient. And usually the way it works for me, at least, is you get on some sort of business or professional oriented call. And then you have like, I don't know, anywhere between 10 or 15 minutes of some kind of ice breaking. It's like you're trying to get things going. You're trying to introduce what you're doing. Sometimes there's a focused agenda, but if it's just kind of like a meet and greet, you end up going through half the call and uh, <laughs> you don't really get anything of substance. So what I was trying to figure out is how do I optimize that first 15 minutes? I don't want to schedule another call. Maybe I don't, maybe I do, but I don't want to have to carry spill over all the pleasantries into another call. Why can't we just break the ice and just make the mood such that we can have a more effective conversation? And the best way I found to do it was to give people a prompt and to give them some <laughs> visual prompt that I don't have to say anything. It's something that they don't expect. And the kind of question that you just asked is what, I don't know, I'd say 50, 60% of the calls that I get on, it's the same. There is like, hey, where are you located? What stadium is that? What, is, why, or, you know, hey, I didn't, <laughs> the, how, why, why aren't you, you know, Celtics or Lakers? And so it just gives me just enough, uh, something out of the blue, something different, differentiator that, that gets people uh, talking about something interesting and allows us to, to flow with the conversation from minute two or three instead of minute 12 or 13. Well, there you go. Bam, marketing, psychology of marketing. And, you know, speaking of marketing, so what's your deal? What is my deal? So my deal is um, I do a couple of things. And um, and from a marketing perspective, uh, my the main thing that I do is head of product marketing at a really cool company called Lifecycle. 
Lifecycle in a word is the leading developer productivity platform. So we are building a platform for helping development teams be more productive and get work done smoother, faster, uh, and better during that pre-release phase. So before the product goes out the door, there's a whole bunch of messy collaboration that has to happen. Uh, and we are building tools for development teams to enable that. And I am, you know, anything that has to do with owning the brand and the positioning and the marketing go-to-market strategy of this uh, of this company, that is, uh, that is what I do. In addition to that, uh, over the years, I have thankfully been able to work with, at this point, probably dozens of small businesses, nonprofits, um, some universities, some government agencies, and anything that has to do with um, product, product marketing, and go-to-market strategy. Everybody has something that they need to go to market with. And right. a lot of times it's just, you know, I found that one of one of the things that people love to hear is when you say to them, let's just think differently. Let's cut out all the fluff. Let's just, you know, let's, we, we don't well, have Hey, to it worked for Apple. That was their slogan for years. Think different. Exactly. But, uh, but people, I and mean, that's actually what attracted me to, to, to you and why, you know, when I saw your content and, and we hit it off, you know, the first time we spoke a few weeks ago is I think you're of a similar mind in the sense that just because somebody does something and writes about it and the industry goes in a certain way, it doesn't mean that it fits for everybody. It doesn't mean that that's, that's that, what's most effective. And that uh, is correct. It, it, it's one of, it's one of my biggest pet peeves. It's just like, and you know, I get people tell this to me a lot when they watch my content, like they're like, oh, wow, I watched all your YouTube videos. They're great. I'm like, yeah, because I'm not sitting here telling you, oh, I just made a million dollars doing this. Here's my secret. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that because there's no secrets. There's just sit down and understand, understand the logic behind it and understand how to market it and understand what you're doing and then plug that in. <laughs> like, I'm not going to sit in, I'm not going to sit here and, and sling you bullshit, you know? Like, yeah, this I think you know, I have I have a colleague who who just posted uh, somebody in another company, a, a friend of mine, who posted recently something that I I disagree with, or maybe I, it's maybe just terminology, but I disagreed in principle. He he wrote something along the lines of, you know, stop talking about your playbooks. There's no such thing as playbooks, and you know, I don't care about your playbooks. There's, there's my, my so on the one hand, I was like, you know, I happen to like playbooks. I think it's cool to conceptualize things and and give some sort of clear uh, vision. I think where I, I agree with him in the sense that, like you said, everybody's different and like every situation has their own kind of target audience and their own go-to-market roadmap. At the same time, uh, and this is why this kind of content is so intriguing, it's like the fact that I had a problem and I can tell you how I solved it in a very specific way, you might not be able to copy and paste that, but you'll definitely be inspired by that. It'll definitely be something which you can think about and apply and borrow from and that's where i think that the playbooks are so potentially valuable. oh for sure because because if you take something at face value if you're if you're absorbing a piece of content like whether it's written visual audio and you're trying to take it as face value you have to understand the context of which the person is writing this meaning he did this or she did this because it worked for them and yeah. in that situation but if you but if you take a step back and you and you don't take it at face value but you see the bigger picture and you're like oh okay i get this how can i apply this to my situation then you'll be able to take it and learn from it and use it this is why i always tell people that in marketing there is no difference between for-profit marketing and non-profit marketing. It is the same thing, same principles, same ideas, same concepts, different R different ROI, different variable, different different names for things. Different channels, and different potential e activities. Exactly, but exactly. Yeah. But on, on, on the surface, it, it, like on, on like the baseline level in, in terms of infrastructure wise, it's the same crap. You want to know why it's the same? It's the same because number one, you're marketing to humans no matter what. And yep. number two is those humans don't care about you or your product or your service. And so no. the game is to basically, like you said, figure out what channels, methods, opportunities you have to at least open up their eyes and make them realize even for a fleeting second that, hey, maybe I can bring value to your to your life. Exactly. Exactly. And this is why when it comes to content, um, especially, especially social content, people, people have to understand before they post something, like I am so sick of like, people posting on LinkedIn. I am so sick of it, like seeing stuff. <laughs> and it be, you, you're funny too, because you write the, like you, you post these little like reels, whatever the hell they're called. And, but, and you make fun of people posting those things. 
And, well, and you know, I, well, I try. That's hard. I, I try not. I try not to make fun of uh, of people. But, but I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I started doing on LinkedIn. Now that you mention it, I, I I took a break. I'll be honest for the last couple of weeks. But what I started doing was, I, I think I titled it something like, um, you know, weekly drops of of LinkedIn content that's actually useful. And uh, <laughs> what I did was I, I would try to go go and collect links and posts of things, which it's not just another rant and it's not just another, hey, I got a promotion or I killed it today. I killed my, you know, my quarterly, uh, whatever. Crushed it. Crushed it, killed it, whatever crazy word you're going to use. I crushed it in six hours. I hit all my uh, quarterly, you know, targets and this and that. Um, all that stuff is great. But again, that's like very, uh, it's very self centered I actually built like a little chart I have uh, the four quadrants of of LinkedIn content um, and the most effective LinkedIn content is stuff which is actually useful to you it's something that will help you and give you a tangible actionable benefit in whatever you're right. trying to do a uh, research percent thing and and there's not enough of that 100 percent 100%. So in terms of what you're saying, the go-to-market and how we just talked about there's no difference between for-profit and non-profit other than the variable changes, how would you how would you approach, you said you've worked with non-profits when it comes to this. What would, what, how would you say the go-to-market methodology and strategy works with a nonprofit, whether there's some, they're a new organization, their existing organization looking to revamp and rebrand and adapt to the, the, the new, the new age and the new generations. How would yeah. you, how would that play well with an organization? So I guess that maybe the best way to frame it is by talking about some of the common like pitfalls that I see, or like some of the misconceptions that I've observed over time. Um, mm. The first one is that is the harsh reality that I just mentioned. It's and it's hard for people to say uh, to hear, but I think it's important to say is that you have to start from the premise that nobody cares about you or your product. I don't care if you're like sol you know, curing cancer or if you're selling some sort of widget. And everything is important. And don't and I'm not minimizing the the, the importance and the effort and all the things. But at the end of the day, if marketing is the bridge between your user, consumer, donor, whatever it is, to your product or service. You have to assume that no one's willingly, if, if people were just walking across that bridge willingly, you wouldn't need marketing in the first place. Exactly. And so the fact that you're doing marketing means that you have to convince well, them. Well, that's to... my favorite. What you just said, that's my favorite thing is like, well, I don't need, I don't need marketing. Why do I have to spend money on marketing? Everybody knows who I am. It's like, no one gives a crap about you. You have to understand this. Nobody cares about you. Like so, if it, yeah. if it was so exactly what you said if it was, if 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 it was so easy in a perfect world people like me and you wouldn't exist we'd be doing but something else. It's a mindset shift. It's a mindset shift, and 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 it's important to to repeat that, especially when you have nonprofits where people are rightfully so so proud of the work that they're doing and they're doing meaningful right. work. Probably, you know, it's it's hard to hear that, but it's an important kind of. Um, well, this right, but, is this is why like organizations, I always tell this to organizations when they bring me in. It's like you have to run this like a business. You can't run it like a passion project because when yeah. you're when you're invested with your all your heart and all your soul and everything like that, you you're kind of blinded to the to the other things that that like actually need to be taken care of, like exactly. getting people paid and marketing and like trying to scale. Like, you know, like you want to save the whales in China. Or you that's know what separates the 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 winners from the the, the organizations that really struggle, it seems, is the people that mm -hmm. adopt that mentality, the for-profit kind of operational mentality. Correct. Um, and that and that kind of leads to the next thing, which is like moving out of like the, the mindset into maybe the more tactical or practical. I think that, you know, and this is not exclusive to nonprofits, but companies and nonprofits particularly, I think that they they need to realize that go to market is not just a, it's not just tweeting something or putting a post on Facebook or launching a website that's not going to market that's not what go to market means i think that go to market strategy it's a it's a deliberate sequence of tasks or you know operations that are really the product of understanding what it is that you're doing. In other words, it really has to be an expression of your roadmap. You have to understand what, what is the competitive landscape? Who are you talking to? How are you talking? About, where are the channels that you're looking? It's it's kind of like this, this all-encompassing reflection. The go-to-market will be as effective as you know your space, your customer, your market. And so people don't necessarily realize all the legwork that goes into preparing for go-to-market. So for example, you know, when people say, and, and a lot of people joke about this, it's like, well, I don't have any competition. You know, ah. 
I created my my uh, vertical, or I'm the only organization in the world that does this. Not only is that wrong, but it actually ah. it actually works against you because yep. it's in your best interest to know what is working and not working with other people in your space. People of have course. already done some of the homework for you. Of course, um, I, I actually just I, I'll interrupt you for a second. I literally yeah. before we hopped on this, I just got off the phone with a guy. He's got a, he's a he's a business. And he's, he's like spinning his wheels a lot. Trying, He's been, he, he created a, CR, a very niche type of product CRM and he's been spinning his wheels a lot. Now he's got competition. I said, it's because you, you, you have to, um, you have to see what they're doing and model after them. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I learned this a long time ago when I got into mar- the marketing world, like Russell Brunson of click funnels this is his like this is his like mantra if it ain't broke don't fix it model after stuff you're not stealing it i remember watching a video of him and he's like you're not stealing it model after it. if it's working just copy it and right. you know that's but like i was telling this guy i was like you have to look at your competition see what they're doing model after what they're doing but inject what you makes you better than them into your copy into your funnels into everything you're doing and exactly. then blow it out of the water i do so this all the time it's it's a great it's a great observation and, and just to make it up even more maybe practical for anybody listening like uh, applicable is like one example of where you can really do this is when it comes to um, let's say different channels, so you have you have a product or service or an organization, you want to find places to market. It could be a podcast, it could be a blog, or some sort of newsletter. I don't know, some sort of thing. So one really kind of e- so easy and clever way that people don't realize that they can do it just just to get very specific for a mo- minute, you can take some sort of um, you know, site traffic tool that's accessible, you know, something like an Ahrefs or something similar. Mm-hmm. But one of your competitors, you can just simply see, well, where is, you know, these are the biggest, this is the biggest person in our space. Let's see where their traffic oh. is coming. Oh, I where do this all the time. I do this yeah. all the time with Google ad campaigns. Exactly. I, I, I see it's, what it's people are doing. It's free and it's sitting there and, and, and it tells it's, it doesn't mean that that's your whole strategy, but what it means is that this is at least a very, it's, it's saving you a lot of time in terms of saying, okay, these are the types of publications I'm going to be targeting. These are the types of activities I'm going to be looking at. Yeah. Um, I do this all the time for organizations when we're, when we're setting up at grant campaigns with the fun for the funnels, we go into SpyFu. We, I mean, we actually pay for SpyFu, but we go into SpyFu and we plug in the URL, see what the competition is doing, take a look at their, at what their, what keywords they're bidding on and see how we can bid or create better copy, better ad copy. That's going to get us higher than them and drive more traffic. And it, yes, you all, it, it's all this stuff is available on the internet. People just don't want to do it because people are too stubborn. Right, right. Um, and 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 actually, that 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 brings me to another thing. I actually wanted to get your take on this because okay. you talk about maybe contrasting um, for profits, nonprofits. One of the interesting things it, it is the same. There's so much. It's the same fundamental principles. But one interesting place where I see a little bit of a divergence um, in terms of the application is when it comes to let's say messaging and content. And I'll explain what mm-hmm. I mean. So if I have a for-profit, you know, my, my, my product, my SaaS product uh, in, my, in my day job. So my goal is pretty simply to get relevant people to my site so that they can sign up. And then hopefully once they're in the door, they'll stick around and they'll use it on their teams. And I, w- I want people to adopt my product and activate themselves as customers and, and stick around with retention. That's, that's okay. kind of simple steps of, of what any any business is looking for you want to get users you want to get paying customers um when it comes to nonprofits, though what i think is interesting is that it seems like you have a fork of two equal opportunities at the same time and and this usually goes underappreciated by the organizations where you have effectively at any given time two things you want to get done on the one hand you want people to use your service you want people, you want to service the, the, the people that you're servicing. At the same time, in, in addition to marketing to that group, you also need to market to the people who are going to fund you. You need to get donors. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a for-profit, it's the same. In a nonprofit, it's two different groups of people. And so, what people fail to realize is that you, that's very different messaging. The, the billionaire donor is not going to be hearing the same message as the needy family or whatever you know your correct. service is. 
And so I'm kind of, I'd be interested to hear from you. How do you, so, how do you do, deal with that toggling between the two, uh, the two groups? So this is a fantastic question. And it's funny that you're asking me the question on my show, but it's all good because this is a fantastic question. This is my method. This is my methodology to my madness and why I'm, I make people very successful. Please God. Is and that, by the way, for the listeners, we did not uh, script this. This is- No, a, a, no, I, I, I don't know scripting. <laughs> I, I don't even know what a script is. Last time I wrote a script was in high school for video production. <laughs> yeah. But- uh, the the way I do this, the way I've see, come about this is that you have two channels, right? Exactly what you said. You're trying to, you have your existing donors that you need to talk to and cultivate and wake up. And then you have the traffic that you're trying to, you're trying to build awareness. So you're trying to bring people in to use the organization. But those people who are users can ultimately become donors or volunteers or some, in some way that you're always going to get, you're going to get a conversion, whether it's a donor, volunteer, or a win or anything. Right. So what we do is we take, the, what I like to do is I take the Google ad, grant, ad grants, we create funnels, we create strong search campaigns based on key search terms that people are actively looking for based around the organization, create landing pages with articles talking about that, what they were looking for, get them in with an opt-in of some sort of freebie that they're trying, that gives them something more tangible to connect with, like, you know, a PDF of this is what we do. This is our services. This is what we're doing. How do you can save the whales? Or here's a checklist to save the dogs. I don't know, whatever the hell you want to do. And then follow up with a strong email sequence, telling stories, storytelling, really building them to connect with you. No asking for money, no nothing, just continuously continuing the conversation where you left off. Yeah. And then with on the other side of things, once we through, I usually end up hitting people around email seven or eight with a partner with us email. You know, you want you're interested in benefiting from our services, partner with us so we can continue to give you the services or help and help others do the services. Now, on the flip side, once we go through that, then we put these people into the main email list where we're sending out already emails talking to that existing list, not asking for money yet but constantly talking to them and then asking for money. But I always use the language partner with us. I never ask for donate now, give us money, anything. It's always about partnering with us because the whole goal is to get both sides to want to be part of the organization and live vicariously through the organization. Even if one, they can't be helped by the organization, for example, if they don't fit that criteria, but they still want to have an active part in the organization or, and, and to, or they, or they can't, or they're not around but they want to live vicariously through the organization because they feel like they're part of something bigger. It's right. that bigger dichotomy of feeling like you're part of something, even when you're like a million miles away. So that makes and, a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it and works. I, just to, just to surf, like to bring that, that's, I, I like a lot of that. And just to surface, like bring it back up a couple of levels to the, the more generalities is that I, I think that that's, again, one of these things that I see and I sense from, it happens in for-profits also, but for nonprofits, for sure, this is an issue is, People, people need to understand the the simple beauty of marketing, where it's like yes. sometimes you ask such I ask some, such simple questions and people are surprised by the how how silly or stupid mm -hmm. the questions are. But even mm -hmm. I said I said, well, why why do you need why do you need this landing page? What's the point? Like, what's the point yeah. of having this landing page? And like they'll they won't you know sometimes I'll push them until we dig in, and what I'm really trying to ask them is well you know everything is 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 a tool. This is just another tool. Who are you trying to talk to? Are you talking to the donors? Is this your sign up for your, you know, you're providing a service to a certain community? Is this where the community is coming? You know, if once you understand that, then we can start crafting the the copy and the look and feel around it and the functionality and the and the user journey. But right. it really, it, it all, all of these things stem from, or even let's say the tactics, you know, uh, the, the different kind of marketing efforts that we're going to spend money on, depending on our goals, it's going to be very different to get your donors than it is going to be to get to people into your events and stuff like that. So start you know people come to me oh i have a ten thousand dollar marketing budget just just you know make it happen like uh my my, yeah. my want to see growth by the end of the quarter and we're it's not like, magicians growth is cool but but there has to be there has to be a little bit of an understanding of well not just what the goals are but 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 what are the tools that we have at our disposal and how are we leveraging each one of these tools and these steps in the funnel to be able to achieve a very exactly very and 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 again it, it's about you don't have to be overly complex with things so people people always miss the boat on that one it's like why do we have to you know you don't have to think so hard you just have to understand people and you have to understand how to reverse engineer people and get them to do what you want them to do and stand out against against everybody else and especially with when when you're a nonprofit, all you have to do is figure out the, what what 
what sells, what is selling to the people that you want to connect with. This is one of the reasons actually, and this again, this is not a product plug, but this is one of the reasons I'm actually pushing, I'm, I'm, I, start, I launched a cohort to teach nonprofits how to podcast. It's called the 60 Minute Nonprofit Podcast Launch Academy, where I'm literally dropping with, with another fellow, Aaron Longerlinter. We're literally take, spending, sitting down with people for an hour, going through a live action, like just like this, teaching yep. you how to start a podcast because podcasting is a phenomenal medium and adds tremendous amounts of depth to your organization to create multiple pieces of content that can be monetized. And when you have another channel to share your story to people who, again, it goes back to the living vicariously through the organization without actually being in that space. When you have a, a reach where people can listen to what you're talking about, follow your story, follow along with you, connect with you, then you're able to do so much more. And right. it's simple, it's easy. And it, and and again, you get like four different pieces of content out of it. So when you're talking about your social media and you're talking about the, your what you're trying to do to show the continuously show those stories and bring people into your community, then you you've got it right there. Love it. And and one of the, it actually reminds me of another link another, will be in the show notes. Another pet peeve of mine, which is um, you know I didn't know if we were going to get to this, but but I'll bring it up now, which is uh, the that whole content creation as just a a a as a discipline. So uh, one of the things I hear a lot, I just, somebody recently asked me, uh, you know, in, in, in the tech space was asking me about, oh, give me some good AI tools for creating content. Wow. And, and I, and especially in the nonprofit space, if somebody has a budget and they want to scale, I heard we can use chat GPT or whatever, fill in the blank to scale, 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 want to be out there, out there. And I'm thinking to myself, no. well, no, maybe, no, you know, maybe these things can be good to potentially scale, but, but only if you have authentic stories to tell and messaging to tell to begin with tell mm -hmm. your to a person from a person to a person say it in a way which is compelling and clear and not buzzwordy and just human to human and then decide how you want to scale that don't do it the other way around by asking chat gpt to uh to come up with some campaign and and just start throwing stuff at the wall no, uh, for sure. And it, 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 it's just sad because people are just like, oh, is ChatGPT going to take over the world? It's going to kill the end of copywriters, kill the end of this. It's like, no, because there actually has to be some chachma behind it. There has to be some, like a brain behind things too. You know, someone, I, it was actually funny. I was having this conversation with my graphic designer, how like you know, someone, like some guy, somebody was approached me. He's that he, he, he got very good at mid journey and this graphic design school wants to, I like this guy a lot. I'm not, I'm not knocking him. I think he's fantastic. He, I love this guy to bits. And like, they want him to teach mid journey to this group of graphic people, intro to graphic design. I was like, if you're teaching them how to use mid journey, what the hell's the point of them being in the course? Like, I mean, like, like, yeah. what? Yeah. like what? it's like, it's, you know, uh, it's like wild. how, you know, like, what's the, you know, like, where's the <laughs> art in it? That's one of the things yeah. that uh, that's one of the reasons why I actually love um, the fact that for the last, let's say year and a half, I've been all in on marketing to developers and my for, for profit endeavors. And I never, I never, I'm not a developer myself. And mm. I never had to, obviously, developers use technology, but I never had to build a product that's speaking specifically to software developers. And the right. reason why that's been so gratifying, it's been very difficult, but it's been gratifying because developers hate fluffy marketing. And like, if you try any of that stuff, they will eat you alive. Of course. And so what it forces people to do, it's like, get forces you to go back to fundamentals and be like, no, 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 just be super clear about what it is that you do, why they should care and why they should give you eight seconds of their time and how they, can, how you can bring value to their lives and then yeah. let them just, and, and that well, really, that, that's, that's everything. funny. You're talking about this because again, I'm just, the, I remember I told you we started late because I was process sending out a contract to somebody yeah. and he, like you said, he has a CRM. He built this, this CRM for a very niche audience and he, his whole issue is he's like so over technical on everything that it's just like, like, I don't care. Just tell me what it does. How is it going to make my life better? And how am I going to make more money by using your product? Exactly. And like, you know, I don't need to sit, you don't need to give me your whole, like, like your whole life story about the demo and everything is actually funny. Cause he picked my brain the other, oh, I said the word I hate. Ugh. He, he like, he, <laughs> he, he, I was talking to him. I know him. He's from here. And, and I was talking to him one day in the synagogue and he was doing, he, he, he asked me for my advice. I'm like, okay, go for it. He's like, I'm doing this, this virtual like summit um, where I'm speaking to like a handful of like X type of people who are in the market for this. 
as like, what sh should I, should I have slides of the each different module in the CRM? What should I talk about? I said, first of all, don't do that. I said, take the main thing. You have to under understand the crowd you're speaking to. Once you understand the crowd you're speaking to, then create your presentation based on the crowd you're speaking to, highlighting the tools, the specific tools in your thing that are going to be, that, that they want to hear about. Yep. If they want to hear about everything else under the sun in the kitchen sink, book a demo with you. That's it. You know, he's like, he's like, okay. So he did what I told him and he, he, he blew up the, everybody's pants off and he got in a, a bunch of people ended up coming to him for, for demos. I said, now you have to, now you have to simplify your demo process. Stop yeah. talking too much about the technical, simplify your, pro your demo process. Like when I do demos of our CRM, I get all, I, I pull up everything. I do this lot. I show the different modules, but I talk like five, like maybe two to three minutes on each thing. And I get excited about it. And I tell, and I, and I tell them why this is going to make your life so much better than what you're currently doing or next to nothing doing right now. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and that's, and that's it's, it's so important. And that's, I, I posted about this on LinkedIn uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I said the most gratifying and useful exercise for me as a content creator and as a marketer is often just to take something, take a product or service description, you know, take your company, take your organization, take your whatever it is, give yourself an exercise, write it down. What does it do? What do you do? What, 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 what is it? I, I met you. Hey, we met, we bumped into each other on the street. We have, you have this offering, this new thing. What does it do? Write mm -hmm. yourself a little paragraph and describe it. Mm -hmm. And then force yourself to go back and shorten that by 30%. And then yeah. go back and force yourself to shorten it again by 30%. And it doesn't mean just like cutting out words. Of it. Find a way to just get no fluff, no extra, you know, superlatives or, or, or wording, just literally just the core specific yes. basic descriptive what is it? And, and, and people actually like to frame this. I think, uh, you know, a very common framework is like my company does this for this group of people so that they can achieve X, Y, and Z. Like that's, that's, you know, it, it should be that clear. It should be that. Yeah. Simple. But, you know, again, with the nonprofits, again, it's a whole, it's a, it's a, you know, they, everyone, they, people like to overcomplicate things and people like to like think that they know better. And it, it it's just, doesn't work with with your marketing you have to keep it very simple just tell people all people want to do is connect with your mission so how can they connect with your mission this is what we do we we do x y and z and we and and don't and, and one thing i learned actually from from sitting down with brahma going down to brahma's house and it makes so much sense is never use the word help in your marketing copy because if they need your they if they if they need your help you know they don't need your help they can do it themselves. They can help themselves. No one needs your help. They can help themselves. Don't tell people I help you do X because exactly. they can help themselves. Exactly. And, and when you avoid <laughs> that word, after, like, I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Oh my God. I was like, my head is just blown off from that one. Yeah. Like yeah. when you, when you, when you get rid of that word from your marketing copy lexicon, then you, you, one, you have to think a little harder, but you, you're forced to become a bit more creative. And, and again, with organizations, when you say we work with, or we, we strive to do X, Y, and Z in order to do X, in order to accomplish X, Y, and Z, it gives people a reason they can connect, they should connect with you. And, you know, you, you said something before, but like businesses, like businesses and nonprofits, really, again, it's the, it's all it, it's all about the storytelling aspect of it too like you, you when you're telling when you ask me that question about how do you how do you deal with that fork well yeah. businesses have the same issue too because you're you're looking to you know especially these startups so don't get me started on that word like when you know like you know it, a startup is like is, is the same thing as a nonprofit. you're broke you ain't got no money you got you got people working for you trying to scrape the scrape the food right. off the floors and and you're trying to and you're trying to get and you're trying to get people to fund you it's, it's the true. same the, the difference is simply uh, yeah i mean the difference there would just be that let's say your your landing page of your marketing site is not necessarily the place where you're not optimizing that for your vcs necessarily um or whatever no but but, but, but it's yeah. still storytelling meaning why should why should this million dollar guy um give a crap about you when everybody else is knocking on his door it's the same thing with fundraising why should why should that one gear give you a million dollar check when everybody else from the yeshiva is knocking on his door too 
you know? Right. So it's like businesses have to have to think like that too, in order to come up with creative stories and creative storylines to continue that marketing flow. Yeah. And you see it with a lot of like SaaS companies where they do have some cute, like little mark, like flows and emails and things like that. But businesses should really adapt to that and learn from nonprofits if they're doing it right in order to be able to keep up with that story. Because follow-up is king, whether it's phone calls, e emails, ads, anything, just constantly keeping people on the top of your mind. That way you're going to be like, whatever. I don't like I, I could go it's, on for yeah, it's, very, it's very important. And, and that actually, uh, you know, I don't know how much more time we have, but just want to bring up one other, one or two other quick points that came to mind as you were talking. I think there's another uh, asset that a lot of nonprofits have and for-profits have the same thing. It's just because there's a parallel. It's, it's just interesting to me is, you know, startups have this issue and nonprofits have this issue. They don't realize that they're sitting on a gold mine very often of storytelling when it comes to the founders, the co-founders. Um, you know, very, very often people look at marketing as like this outside function and this, you know, thing that you pay somebody to do or you hire somebody to do. And one of the things I love to tell uh, the, the folks in my company who very, most of them are highly technical developers who would never think as, of themselves as marketers. I yell and scream from the rooftops that we're all marketers. You are a, you are a better marketer than me because you are the you built this product and you are the ideal, you know, you're the consumer. You represent right. the, the persona that I'm going after. And so the extent to which, you know, organizations and startups can pull those stories out of not just the people that they're servicing, but of the people that build it and leverage that and have them have a voice in whatever way they feel comfortable. It could be podcasts, it could be on social, it could be just what, whatever content. It's just a gold mine of opportunity that I think people miss. For sure. Well, I guess, you know, the truth is we are actually out of time, but I, I, I could keep talking to you for hours. But yeah. I mean, what what takeaway would you give to nonprofits who are looking to people who are looking to start a nonprofit in terms of the go to go to market strategy? What would you say is the most important thing for non for somebody who's looking to run start a nonprofit, build up that infrastructure, and go to market? Yeah, great question. I would say two or three things. I mean, number one is first realize that it's a process, and that if you think that you're just going to hand somebody some budget or that you're just going to get it right from day one, um, you know, you're you're mistaken. So just be ready, be ready to iterate and experiment. And it's like easy to sit here and kind of be sarcastic about the way people do things, but you and I both know that like marketing is really just a glorified series of experiments and educated yes. guests. And it's uh, science. It's science, except we don't get to blow stuff up. And uh, so that's number one is the mindset. Number two, I would say the first most important thing is what you and I have been talking about for the last 20 minutes, which is just refine your story and your storytelling. Figure out, it's not just about a creative slogan or a hero kind of line on your website. It's like, what? who are we servicing? What are we servicing them with? What is the benefit of our product or service? And once you have that super defined and super clear, each one of those things, you can start asking yourself, well, okay, if this is the person I'm servicing, where do they hang out? And if this is the pain point, well, what's the best way to articulate it? How do I express that? And once you have those pillars, you can start building on it in terms of your actual messaging and, and channels and tactics. But without that clarity, you're just kind of moving in the dark. And, and so I would start there. Yeah, fair enough. Well, Zevi, this was fantastic. I'm so happy we finally got to do this. And Absolutely. I, 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 yeah wow i i got nothing else to say this is fun <laughs> i got nothing else to say on yeah, this happy to have a follow-up and who knows one day when i start my podcast we'll uh we'll return the favor well you can always join the podcast launch academy and learn how to <laughs> podcast it's only 120 dollars for and and you get so much out of it, it your, your head will spin so um like i said pleasure sitting down with you and let's, let's make it happen. and let's do it yeah nice all the best sure.